name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We've all heard, of course, this passage from the Gospel of Matthew about the demoniacs many times. Which way do we go with it? Hear something new from it. St. Theophon the Recluse, in interpreting this passage, looks to the very end. And we see these people, when they saw what Jesus had done, asked him that he would depart from them, to leave. They did not want this. Of course, they were making their living in a way that was not justifiable in their culture by selling swine and raising them. But they did not want to change that, despite the fact that they had seen Christ overturn something that they were not able to cope with. These devils that had possessed these two men for many years, that they terrified the people. And Jesus, with a word, cast them out. Only at his permission, these things are cast out. But yet they still ask for him to leave. What would our response be to so great a gift? We see in the lives of the saints, of course, the father of these two men we celebrate today, Boris and Gleb, St. Vladimir. St. Vladimir was a horrific pagan before he was St. Vladimir. He had nothing that was admirable about him, except he was a man of great power. When he had been cast out of his kingdom, he went to the land of the Vikings. And when his father was gone, he decided to come back and take over his land in Kiev. And he brought back approximately, said, 6,000 Vikings with him. And of course, destroyed the people there and took over. He was known as quite a bellicose man, very warlike, loving war always seeking more land to take over. He had many pagan wives. He was a horrible idolater, loved violence, loved human sacrifice, brought in the worship of pagan gods, and on and on and on. Not somebody we would like. But yet his heart was still striving for something. And when he had a sacrifice at one point to his god Perun, he had two people chosen to be killed as the sacrifice, Theodore and John, who were known Christians. He killed them, but something hit his heart about the way they accepted this sacrifice, how they accepted themselves as sacrifices for Christ and participating in his passion. And it began to tear at his heart. Why were they willing to do this? And he began, of course, to seek out through the empires we know the story for Christ, the real God. He didn't know it at first, but that is what he was seeking. His mother, of course, Olga, had been a Christian, but it didn't have very much impact on him. He was doing his own thing. She was the first. There were others around here and there. Kiev had been mixing with Byzantium for a while. But it was not the accepted provision of the land. You know the story of how he sent those emissaries to Constantinople, the Hagia Sophia, he saw the worship, and of course we know the famous lines that they did not know whether they were in heaven or whether they were on earth when they saw the worship there. He tried the others. He tried Judaism, Islam, Roman Catholicism. He did not find that. St. So Vladimir gradually began to convert. And eventually he arranges a marriage by helping Basil, Saint, uh, the Emperor Basil in Constantinople, by requesting that he have his daughter in marriage. Anna or for a genital. So think about what that word means of a robo, royal or noble birth. Purple, porphyry, and genitals. It's a beautiful name. And they were very hesitant to do this, of course, because they did not marry off to pagans. But eventually, Vladimir accepts baptism. You've seen the icon of it. Of course, you have it in the back wall back there of him baptizing Kiev. And the people of the Dnieper are put into the waters. Russia becomes Christian. But this was not something of just political expediency. When the Lord hit Vladimir's heart, he was cured, of course, as we hear the Traparian, of his blindness, spiritual blindness. And he immediately changed everything in his life. He abolished the death penalty, which is astounding in that day and age. He destroyed the pagan temples and erected Christian temples. He got rid of the pagan wives, put them aside, and hurt them very much. And he had his only one wife. He began to be charitable and give to the poor and to repent. The entire laws of the kingdom changed. 
He came into the presence of Christ, and everything could not remain the same for him. And his younger sons bore us and glad in the same way. They accepted Christ, but some of the sons did not so much. And when the older son, the desiring to heal Boris and Gleb, even though they had no desire for the kingdom, they were willing to accept their older brother's rule over them. He seeks them out to kill them anyway, as Boris says to them as they are stabbing him with spears, forgive them. And he rejoices that as the Lord had accepted his passion for our sins, he was able to participate in the Lord's passion for the sake of his own sins and the same Boris. Gleb the same way, they slit his throat as he just sits there and prays for them. They accepted Christ with everything, and everything was changed. As Abraham left Haran at a word and goes to a land which he would never receive. As Moses goes back to a people that he could have rightly feared, given his past, and goes to Pharaoh and calls his people across, not fearing the journey across the Sinai, which we all must make in our spiritual lives that land of the desert, so that he would come near the promised land, which he ultimately would not receive, but still continuing on his journey. We see it constantly in the lives of the saints, with our own beloved Saint Mary, and she can't enter the temple, radically, radically changes her way of life, and becomes an image of repentance for the whole world. What desert father or mother is more <coughs> influence than that one woman? What Desert father or mother has their own Sunday dedicated to them every year and has their life read aloud in church. It's an amazing thing. But we see it throughout the history of these church, the church, these people who once they run to the presence of Christ, realize that everything has to change because light has come into their midst. There can be no more darkness. That purifying balm that cures every wound has come and the response must be made. And here these people had a wonderful opportunity in the land of the Gergesenes to repent, but yet they did not. They said, depart from our coasts, go away from us. And I know I certainly am one of them every single day of my life. At some point, <clears throat> there's a moment when I say, not right now, Jesus, I don't have time for that. I'd rather do this, Jesus. I'd rather listen to this or watch that or talk about this or hear about that or something I know I'm not supposed to be doing, in my heart at least. I'll, I'll talk to you later, Christ. Is that what we're really supposed to be doing? Certainly not. Because when the Lord calls Matthew, he gets up and follows. When the Lord calls Peter and Andrew, they leave and follow. When he calls James and John, they leave and follow and on and on and on. We see in the early Acts of the Apostles, they give away everything shared in common and follow and live according to the gospel to the nth degree with nothing held back. And that is what we are called to, to give our very lives for Christ. If someone were to see us, would they would know, would they know that we are an Orthodox Christian? Not because we have a sign on us, not because we have a sticker on our car, not because of the way we dress, but because of our behavior, perhaps the way we dress, would they know? If the Savior were to come into our living rooms this afternoon and sit down with us, would we want to flip the channel really quickly from what we wanted to watch? Or would we sit there and watch it with him, with joy? Would we keep the radio station on the thing we were listening to, or would we not want him to hear that? Would we continue to eat that cheeseburger on the Friday when we know he doesn't want us to do that. He's sitting there. Would we be in the car shouting, you idiots, and everything else to the people that drive by us when that person is in the image and very likeness of God and made a mistake just like we do thousands of times every year? You can't not drive as fast as we do and tons of steel at each other and not make mistakes. Forgive and have mercy. Would they know that we were Christians? We act like nobody can see us, so I can say what I want. I heard a priest telling a story of a parishioner in his parish who told him when he got to church, he went to confession, said, I just made an obscene gesture at someone in traffic, and I looked at the guy's face, and it was the deacon. <laughs> it's pretty horrible. It's pretty horrible. 
is a famous story of the person, I've heard it in various versions, of the woman in traffic who's driving up to somebody, tailgating, honking and honking and screaming. The police officer knocks on their window, puts them in cuffs, takes them away to the prison, and then they give them a step back later, apologize, why did you arrest me? Well, we thought you had stolen the car. You had a Jesus fish on the back of the car, and you had you know, stickers about Christ, but you weren't behaving as a Christian. You had to have been stolen. Oh, that we were held to such a high standard. But we are. And if we realize that the very, very reality is not only is our guardian angel looking at us, but the saints are looking at us, and the Savior of all, the God of the universe, is always looking at us. His camera doesn't go off at brief moments. He doesn't miss the images. Because he looks with love. He wants to see what his children are doing. So he can guide them and love them and bring them closer. But do we try to cover up the camera and say, not now, Jesus? Or do we change? Do we hold ourselves to the standards of the saints? I've been reading recently St. Basil the Great's long rules in his own baptism. His own baptism, he talks a little bit about baptism, but for the most part, he talks about Christian behavior and all the excuses people come up with. And he says, well, I be judged if I just do that one little thing wrong, like the others. And he points out rather quickly, depart from me, for I never knew you. The virgins with the lamps who did not have the oil, and on and on and on. He calls us to follow his commandments. He calls us to be holy, for I am holy. Be perfect, as my Father in heaven is perfect. To a very high standard, which is absolutely impossible for any one of us. But yet, with the grace of the Holy Spirit, which received in holy baptism, it is absolutely possible. We are called to be little gods, little Christ, <coughs> to be raised and deified the image and likeness of God, to participate with His grace pouring out upon us in His uncreated light. We have no excuse. Nobody in this room certainly has an excuse. We've been given it all, every single thing. And every difficulty that happens in our life, we should look and try to imagine, maybe in reality, that the right-hand blessing of Christ is in this icon, is blessing everything that happens in our lives. It's not happening without his allowance, the trials, the tribulations, the sicknesses, the illnesses, the insults, everything is happening with his forbearance. Why? Because he loves you more than you could possibly ever love yourself. He is love, the image of love, love, the reality of love. Love doesn't describe it. The wrong word. We don't have the word. He's beyond anything we can imagine. That he comes into our midst, the demons recognize him. Do we recognize him? He's in every one of the people in this room. He's in the icons. He's in the mysteries. He's in the trees out there. He's in creation everywhere. He's in our worst enemy offering us blessing. But do we say, depart from our posts? Or do we watch the example of St. Vladimir, of Saints Boris and Gleda, and act truly as Christians, realizing that everything that comes upon us is a blessing from God. And God open our hearts to His presence this day and grant us the strength to respond that may it be unto me according to thy word, to everything that he offers us. Amen. Amen.